Hello everyone and welcome to His Author's Voice and I am the author Jack Sanger. I live in the Pyrenees in the south of France and the other day two friends visited Bougarac Mountain which is about 40-50 miles from here and even sent me a poem concerning its mystical properties. It got me thinking. I researched it and from that research came this short story. I hope you like it. Bugerach Mountain. It's almost a cliche to say that fate smiles when you're in the right place at the right time. Nothing could be truer for two travellers, Dominic and Freya Stringer, who were on an extended break, having saved up for the joys of being footloose. Neither had close family nor interest in regular employment. They were crossing the south of France, staying at pre-Christian burial mounds. So, being somewhat otherworldly in their interests, they decided to experience Bougarac Mountain in Roussillon. It was popular among New Agers, known as the last refuge possible for mankind when Armageddon arrives a possible landing point for alien spacecraft, or a portal to occult dimensions, among other myths. It seduced decent tourist interest, mainly from those of a particular unorthodox outlook. The fact that a Russian monk had immolated himself on its peak a couple of months back had given it a shot in the arm for popularity. The burning mine in Yura Robes was imaged everywhere in the world's media. His message of impending doom, however, despite a bitter war in Europe and acrimony in the Far East involving nuclear powers, was brushed aside as little more than the demented howl of a sick soul. Dominic and Freya were preppers. They carried a two-week survival kit in rucksacks everywhere. It was a warm, over-hot day as the planet continued its surge of climate change. They'd parked their old jeep in the village, had a black coffee in a bar followed by copious water and set off intending to scale the small peak. Two unrelated events occurred simultaneously. Freya gave a yell of discovery. She'd gone to pee behind some bushes and discovered a cave entrance screened by thickly entwined, undisturbed nettles, brambles and home oak. Dominic at the same moment heard what sounded like sirens in the far distance and prolonged car horns down below and shouts. It made him turn on the news on his mobile phone. His French wasn't good, but he heard the words monde and guerre and nucléaire being screamed by a panic-stricken newsreader before the phone went silent. He ran to Freya, yelling, I think it's nuclear war! At the same time, seeing the cave entrance... Gulping fear driving them, without further words, but at cost to their skins, they forced their way through and inside. All over the world, people, young, old, strong, weak, rich and poor, became hysterical as the news spread from those awake to those asleep. With varying degrees of logic, population stampeded for refuge, as the scattered seeds of warheads fell from the skies. 
Meanwhile, in the cool silence of the cave, Freya turned to him. You're certain? There's panic in the village. Sirens. Screams. Terrified screaming on the news before it went dead. She said quietly, Well, we've been prepared for five years for this. She tapped her rucksack with her foot, including weeks of potassium iodide. Yes. We'll need water in a couple of days. Yes. She was thinking more clearly than him. So, first thing, let's see what's here. It seems as though it goes a fair way back. They donned headlamps, shouldered their bags and edged deeper into the recess. In the rear wall there was an exit tunnel at head height, a bit blocked by rubble. It took half an hour to clear it. He helped her up first and, using the pile of rocks they'd created as leverage, he followed her. They crawled a narrow passage for a moment or two, some water trickling around them, but almost immediately it gave way to another cave. It was dimly lit with a golden fluorescence. Hmm. Some kind of bug, I think, he said. Never seen anything like it. With their lamps off, they could just about see enough to preserve their batteries should they need to. They crossed the cavern floor. Another short tunnel, this time unblocked, led to a further cavern. It was, if anything, more brightly lit than the previous one. A shallow trough ran along one side and water flowed a few inches deep. They were very tired. I think we should camp, she said. Rest. They erected their compressed air-powered tent in seconds, trying not to imagine the terrors at loose in the world outside. There was enough fluorescent light for him to set up the stove and sort out packets of dried food, while she went off with a carbon filter bottle to get some water. Hey, Don, she called. This is weird. Wow. No, really bizarre. Cave paintings. He hurried over. She was running her hands over the wall. As he arrived, he saw painted figures come alive and stay lit for several seconds after her hands hovered over them. What the fuck? he murmured. The scene depicted identically dressed humans walking among deer-like creatures in an idyllic scene of fields of fruits, trees and plants and what looked like small domes. Go further back, he said. Look, look, that's Bugarak Mountain. But it was separated into two halves. And bridging the gap at its peak was a burning man. To the left they could just make out what looked like black steepling clouds. Do you think it's... she asked, leaden voiced. Light it up, he said. Her hand moved over it, revealing a firework display of mushroom explosions in the sky and on the ground. Buildings, trees, vehicles, people were thrown like flotsam into the air. What's it mean? she asked. What do you think? I, I don't know. Two worlds, she said, divided. But which two? If that's ours, he pointed at the devastation of bombing in the left-hand tableau, what's this other one? And who painted it? They ate in silence 
and took to their sleeping bags, clinging to each other, trying to shake off a profound sense of isolation and dread. Where had the bomb struck? Who had survived? They could not meditate the horrors from their minds. After a while, they managed to gain some equilibrium. More exploration, she suggested, eventually. Okay, y you know, I, I can't get the cave paintings out of my head. I mean, they look more like something a kid has just done to while away the hours. That crack down the middle of the mountain. Good world, bad world. The burning man with his legs astride, both. What's it saying? And the people on the paradise side are strange. They're all bald, rogue-like Buddhists. Can't tell the sex. Don't appear to be weapons anywhere. It's all peaceful. They cleared up, packed everything in their rucksacks and made their way across the cavern. The floor began to incline upwards. The chamber narrowed into a corridor, still suffused by golden light. Freya was ahead. She suddenly made a sweeping gesture with her hand across her face and down her body. Ugh! Weirdness, she said. Oh, it's like walking through cobwebs. He followed and had the same sensation of pushing through an invisible silk curtain. Immediately the air became warm and the light intensified. They could switch off their lamps. The walls of the corridor had lost their rough irregularity and become smooth and almost translucent. The light emanated from within them. Freya turned to him and grabbed him in a sudden hug, smiling. How do you feel? she asked. Funny enough, I was going to ask you, he said, holding her gently. I feel really good. The tiredness has gone. They held hands and walked on until they saw what was undoubtedly a door ahead, a bright slab of translucent stone across the corridor. As they reached it, it opened and they were drenched in a multi-layered rich scent. Stepping through, they found themselves in an arch, looking down a valley. Jeez, what is this? he said. I think I know, she said her eyes glistening. We've crossed from the world, our world, to the right side of the wall painting, the peaceful side. Look over there, the monks working on the land. Ah, yes, I can see them, but Freya, where are we? Somewhere, Perhaps it came from the walls, perhaps from the very air. A young child's voice spoke quietly in English. Freya and Dominic Stringer? Yes, they said, surprised, together. You were the last two to enter before we closed the gate. Fate, you might say. Take the path down the hill for registration, if you please. That was Bugrach Mountain. I hope you add it to places of interest and you might visit it on the Grand Tour of the South of France. There are many other short stories, a lot of which are science fiction, on this podcast site. So I hope you subscribe and listen to them. Or if you prefer reading stories, and hearing them, you can go to my site, which is www.jacksanger.com. And there you'll find novels, 
plays and short stories for downloading or donation. It's entirely up to you. Meanwhile, tell your friends. It's all for now. I'll be back soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.